watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Download Daily now. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. when you imagine a conspiracy against you, when there isn't one. According to psychiatrist R.D. Lang, there's no word for someone who is being conspired against and doesn't know it. She thought it was a dream. Even when she couldn't find her camera the next day, she didn't give it a second thought. which is why she never mentioned it to the next tenant who moved into the same apartment. A working student named Sue Levesque. So weeks later, when Sue Levesque is taking a shower and the shower curtain suddenly sucks in on her as if someone had opened the front door, she shrugs it off as just her imagination. Then her spare keys, which she always keeps on the stereo speaker, go missing. It's confusing because the chain lock was still on and the stick is still wedged in the balcony door. The super lives directly above her. When she goes home for Thanksgiving, she asks him to keep an eye on her place while she's away. When she returns, she's rattled that the super says he thought he heard someone in her apartment the day before. It wasn't her. Nothing is missing except the hockey stick normally wedged in the balcony door. She's tempted to call the police, but what would she say? Someone broke into my apartment and didn't take anything? Instead, she settles for the super making her a new stick. That night, she can't sleep, trying to figure out what to do. The next morning, she puts a jar outside the door. If it's moved, she'll know someone was in her apartment. Then she sets off for work. Coming home that evening, she's spooked to find that the jar has been Then she notices the bathroom door is closed. Living alone, she never closes it. Someone is in there. Someone she doesn't know. And they're dead. Words spill out of her mouth about a dead body in her bathroom. He tells her the victim is a teenage girl who babysits the super son. He calls 911. It seems only seconds before the police and the ambulance arrive. Sue hears the commotion. She hears someone shouting something about resuscitation. Then she hears the victim's mother. Then she hears the mother's anguished scream. 
The victim is a 15-year-old who lives in the next building. Her name is Carol Ann Jennings. It breaks your heart. After the emergency crews leave, the IDENT unit goes in. The first thing they do is collect short-lived evidence, any evidence that might be subject to changes in weather or might easily be contaminated. A soil sample just inside the door. A footprint on the balcony. And hairs and fibers. If we can see it, then we're going to collect it. And in other words, if we can see a hair or a fiber, then we're going to very carefully collect that. Hairs, fibers, footprints. These are all known as trace evidence. In this case, where there was no eyewitness, trace evidence was to be crucial. The IDENT unit will examine the footprints. The hairs and fibers will be sent to the forensics expert at the Center of Forensic Sciences. We deal with the hairs one by one. We have to deal with them as individual hairs and individual fibers. And we subject them, each of these individual fibers, to a battery of tests. It was lucky Jim Crocker was a patient man because it would take months and months to examine and analyze all the trace evidence from this ugly murder. To further their investigation, police asked Sue Levesque to go through the apartment and tell them if she notices anything out of place. Of course, she tells them about the jar. That someone has rearranged her books and that she's missing a bra. Meanwhile, the victim's body is sent to the autopsy. External examination of the body showed uh, a ligature mark across the uh, front of the neck uh, and mainly to the right hand side of the neck, but crossing the midline to the left in this particular case. The ligature uh, was a brassiere. In association with the ligature mark, there were multiple areas of abrasion, meaning scraping of the top layers of skin. And it's not unusual in cases such as this that the victim will uh, cause injury to the skin in an attempt to uh, get the hands or the ligature off the neck. This woman was conscious and was fighting for her life as she was being strangled. But what was she doing in Sue Levesque's apartment? Sue had found the chain lock just as she left it, and the stick still wedged perfectly in the sliding door. We pick up the story with the investigators. So we found out that this, uh, the superintendent of the building is who she babysat for, and we learned that the apartment was totally secured, so we became very suspicious of him because he would probably have access to that apartment. And uh, we immediately responded to interview him and uh, in the upstairs apartment. But when the police questioned the superintendent, his alibi is that he was at work the whole time. About the same time, detectives hear from the victim's mother about a possible suspect in a nearby town who had once sexually abused her daughter. It turns out that both the super and the other suspect have ironclad alibis. So it throws everything back to the apartment. What was the victim doing in Sue Levesque's apartment? And how come both doors were still locked? The answer was to be found in these traces of paranoia. Exhibit A, hairs and fibers. Investigators question Sue Levesque again, this time about anything unusual that may have happened the day of the murder.
she was just leaving for work when she saw a guy quickly turn away. It aroused her suspicions. She thought to herself, this is the guy who's been breaking into my apartment. She just convinced herself she was being ridiculous when she drove past his car a moment later and noticed it was empty. That's why she memorized the license plate number. Police traced the car to a Barney Lomage. Lomage lives in the basement flat at his mother's. When police question him, he flatly denies his car has been in front of the victim's building at any time during the day. They were gone for approximately 20 minutes. We then asked, was it a white MGB? And they said, yes. Is it the right license number? Yes. We said, could you go back and uh, set up surveillance on him? We wanted to keep track of him. We wanted to know what his whereabouts were at all times. We wanted to see where he was going to lead us to. Um, we knew nothing about Barney Lamage other than the information that Sulevac had given us. Police hustled back just in time to catch Lomage doing something suspicious. I went to the manhole, looked down it with my flashlight, and I could see a knife lying in the bottom. The manhole cover was removed. I climbed down inside, photographed it, and collected the knife from the uh, sewer. The curious thing about this particular knife is that it's a bread and butter knife. So uh, when we collected it, um, we really didn't know what it was, uh, how it was connected to the scene at that particular time. Why was he ditching a butter knife? The victim hadn't been stabbed. The ident unit was baffled. Meanwhile, detectives get a break. We then went back in and commenced interviewing the superintendent again. And I can recall saying to him, by the way, do you know Barney Lamage? And he said, no, I don't. And then he thought for a minute, and he said, Barney, just a minute. And he went out to, I believe, his kitchen area, and he got his record book. And he says, yeah, here he is right here, Barney Lamage. He used to live here. And we said, oh, that's interesting. Where did he live? And he said, in the apartment where the murder occurred. When questioned by police, Lomash swears he spent the day filling out applications at an employment office 30 kilometers away. He gives officers the name of the woman he dealt with. Police drive the route five totally different ways to see if it's possible to fill out the application and still have time to commit the murder. It is. So all these pieces were fitting together. Barney Lomash is now their strongest suspect. Police scrutinize his every move. And now he's going into a bush riding with two other young females on horses. So we kept close surveillance as close as we could on him. We were concerned that, oh, we're going to be in trouble if they don't come out of that bush all intact. As soon as he came out of that uh, stable, he got in his car and left. He went a very short distance down the road, and we asked our surveillance team to do a rolling stop with him. Bob and I approached the car, and he was immediately arrested for first-degree murder. But when detectives meet with the chief prosecutor, he's concerned that their evidence on Barney Lomage is woefully thin. Police get a search warrant to check out Lomage's apartment. They find silverware whose pattern matches the butter knife he dropped in the sewer, and a roll of film. In situations like this, the police always hope it'll contain photos of the victim and implicate the suspect. But the photos turn out to be from a party. None of the pictures show even a trace of Carol Ann Jennings, Sue Levesque, or Barney Lomage. When police interview the tenant who lived in the apartment before Sue Levesque, she recalls her strange dream and her missing camera. It turns out the photos from the camera in Lomage's room are ones she took of a party she attended. Obviously, it hadn't been a dream. But that only proves he was in the apartment a year ago. Investigators needed to prove that Barney Lomage was with Carol Ann Jennings in Sue Levesque's apartment on the day of the murder. The very foundation of forensic science is based on a theory that every criminal will always take something away from the scene of a crime 
and leave something behind, even if it's only a trace. The fingerprints that were useful for us in this uh, investigation were the fingerprints of uh, our deceased on the textbooks that were in the bedroom. Investigators theorized that the victim must have seized the books as the only possible weapon to defend herself against her attacker. And uh, we also dusted a uh, part of the balcony at this residence, the front balcony, and found a footprint. Uh, and that footprint, of course, was useful because that was later identified as being made by the shoe of our accused. Police also obtained hair samples from Barney Lomage. What you see is one of the hairs from our accused, and this was found present on the bedclothes that were present. As you can see from the convoluted nature of the hair ending here, this is the root end. This is what we would term a ribbon root. And it indicates that the hair was in the active growth phase at the time it was pulled from the scalp. And in fact, it allows us to say that this was forcefully removed. But investigators still have a problem because a good defense lawyer could argue that Barney Lomage's hairs and footprints were found in the apartment because he used to live there. Trace evidence can be used by either side. Investigators need to find trace evidence connecting Barney Lomage, his apartment, his car, the victim, and Sue Levesque's apartment. In this case, the painstaking and arduous process is a two-way street. Some cases involve a considerable amount of interplay between ourselves and the investigators. Uh, we develop some evidence, uh, we relate what our findings to them, and they in turn uh, consider the meaning of this evidence and can it possibly lead to other findings with respect to fibers or hairs. As an example, in this case, we surfaced within the apartment where the murder occurred we surfaced a number of red fibers. They were present on the bedclothes, they were present on the deceased, and yet within the apartment, there was no source for these uh, fibers. Investigators get another search warrant and obtain a number of articles from the accused bedroom. One of the articles is Barney Lomash's red dressing gown. Once we had established or mounted some of these fibers from the dressing gown and started comparing them with the fibers that appeared at the scene, we were able to say that, yes, they are the same. But forensic investigators have a saying, you can never have too much evidence. As the trial date approaches, Jim Crocker produces a chart with more than 150 samples that identify various kinds of trace evidence, hair, and numerous fibers from the murder scene, Lomage's car, and his apartment. Police surmise Barney had been stalking Caroline. From his car, he could track her movements as she came down from babysitting in the super's apartment to go back home. On the morning in question, he waited till Sue Levesque had left for work and broke into her apartment. He replaced the jar where he thought it had been. Then, he waited just inside the door until he heard Carol Ann in the hall. He grabbed her and pulled her into the apartment. She struggled. He forced her into the bedroom where he tried to get her onto the bed. She tried to fight him off with whatever was nearby. She grabbed Sulevec's books. Finally, he forced her into the bathroom and strangled her with the bra. Then he straightened the books and was going to straighten the rest of the apartment. When he heard a siren, he quickly relocked the front door and gently let the stick fall back into place.
Now we know how he got out. The question is how he got in. At the trial, Dennis Cullen demonstrated how he thought it was done. And then reach in and slide the chain up using the knife, and you're in. When the ident officer did it in court, the jury gasped. We had uh, a witness tell us that as a six-year-old, she, she was sexually assaulted by Lamage. As a six-year-old, this happened. So, I mean, his, you know, his uh, evilness went, went back that far. In the end, Barney Lomage was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. And here's a girl that was 15 years old. She lived a very short life. Uh, she was just an average teenager. If that doesn't motivate you to, to do your job well, then nothing will. And what about Sue Levesque, the young woman who had to wrestle with her own paranoia? She thought it unusual enough to write down the license number. Had she not done that, this case would have been much more difficult, if not unsolvable. She provided us with a ton of forensic evidence in this case because of the fact that she was able to point us in the right direction so quickly. And she was a witness of witnesses. She really was fantastic. Barney Lomage might have become a serial murderer, but he didn't, thanks to a great investigative team, a dream witness, and a crack forensic scientist who used a strand of fiber to give Barney enough rope to hang himself. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. makes forensic science so powerful is that sometimes it's the little things that end up being so big in an investigation. These are the cases that state etched in the scientist's memory and documented in their scrapbook. A year after Alan Malloy is charged with theft and possession, he is hired as a part-time maintenance man. A week later, he's found by the safe in the administration office and fired by the head caretaker. Two weeks later, the head caretaker's kid brother, John Mitchell, is working what would have been Malloy's shift, trying to earn extra cash for Christmas. Working alongside him is Wesley Carpenter, who studied urban and regional planning at university before being forced to quit due to financial difficulties. Because of his interest in urban issues, he volunteers at the community center. This is only his second Saturday helping out. a caretaker at the center, arrives for his evening shift. He looks for John and Wesley, but can't find them anywhere. In the executive office, he finds John's coat. He 
phones the head caretaker, John's older brother, but ends up speaking to his wife. She's positive John is working the afternoon shift. He tells her to hang on and he'll look again. This time, in the boiler room, he finds John. There was so much blood, Eves later testifies that he flipped out. He went into shock and just wanted to get the hell out of it. The police are called to the scene. A purplish fluid from punctured air conditioning drums is oozing onto the floor and mixing with blood. John and Wesley are dead, and they'd been blasted with some kind of a weapon. We pick up the story with the investigating officer. When we first enter, we have this massive amount of blood. We have the uh, purplish liquid on the floor, and I'm not close enough to the bodies at that point to tell that they have been shot. I can see the trauma to the head, and, and from a distance of the doorway, is all this blood from these head wounds? Eventually, we made our way to the bodies and, and obviously up close and examined the bodies. You can see the gaping wounds on either side of the chest cavity, laterally, left and right. Both of them were shot the same way. Even though it's two in the morning, Detective Strathdee calls his favorite firearms expert, Finn Nielsen. He tells Finn he needs some help. When my phone rings at 2 in the morning and everybody's home, then I know it must be the police probably that are calling me about something. We, we get called out uh, relatively routinely. In fact, I made it the practice of having my home number on my business cards because uh, as far as I'm concerned with the job we do, we should be available at any time. Finn works at the Center of Forensic Science where they have an extensive gun library. Most of these guns have been confiscated in crimes and turned over to the firearms section after the court case. It's particularly useful in no-gun cases. That is, crimes committed with a gun which cannot be found at the scene. There were these, these two dead bodies lying there, and uh, to me, they had obviously been shot. Uh, one of them, he was lying on his back, and there was damage to the front of his, his sweater. And of course, he was lying in a, in a huge pool of blood, so if he hadn't been shot, he'd been stabbed with something pretty heavy. I thought he'd been shot. And also, of course, I saw the cartridge cases lying on the floor, which, don't ask me why, but they hadn't picked up and taken with them, which was okay with me. When it comes to cartridges or bullets, Finn has a photographic memory. He can tell immediately the 300 gauge cartridge at the scene is for a rifle. But it's such a common cartridge, it could have come from any number of rifles. But after 25 years as a firearms expert, Finn Nielsen gets a flash of forensic intuition. He picks up a piece of wood. It means nothing to the IDENT unit. It means nothing to the investigating officer. In fact, no one would have even bothered to collect it. But Finn senses it's important, though he just can't figure out why. An unassuming splinter of wood. Exhibit A. The difference between someone getting away scot-free or being convicted of murder. Though it was well past three in the morning, Finn told investigators to meet him back at the Center of Forensic Science. The little light went on, you know, it's in your, in your head, and I said to the detectives, I said, I think I know what kind of gun you're looking for. So um, they said, really? You know, expressions of disbelief and so on, but uh, I was pretty sure I knew what it was. That's what it looks like. Just your average uh, normal hunting rifle. And the, the dimensions of it and everything else, it, it just uh, yelled Savage 99 at me. That was a crucial piece because uh, the investigation then went to 
Are there any 300 Savage caliber rifles stolen in this area? Well, within the preceding week, there had been one reported to the Metropolitan Toronto Police, and it was within six blocks of the community center where the break-in had occurred. The 300 Savage rifle was one of three weapons that were stolen from the house. So the investigation at that point turned to let's solve the break-in. Because young criminals are proud of themselves when they steal guns, they brag about it to their friends. That's how detectives got to the thief. Police put Terry King under surveillance. King, as police later learn, comes from a notorious family who took great pride in who committed the most brutal criminal act. Terry King's father had been convicted of manslaughter. In another murder, Terry King's uncle had been convicted of manslaughter. And a first cousin was convicted of killing a policeman's son. Terry King himself had been convicted of armed robbery, jailed and prohibited from possessing a firearm for five years. Police decided to swoop down and pick up Terry King and Alan Malloy. The pair are questioned separately. When Terry King is confronted with what the police already know, he promises to lead them to the rifle if he is allowed to talk to his girlfriend first. He is told they can speak privately, but that police will be watching. They chat and chat and chat. And all of a sudden, she steps back from him, and she starts laughing. They complete their conversation. Uh, she comes out, take her to another room. And I said, could you tell me what caused the laughter? And her response to me was that he asked her, would she wait 25 years for him? And that's when she stood back and laughed. In crimes committed by partners, it's common if the partners get caught to see them suddenly turn on each other. You know, no honor among thieves. That's what happened here. According to Alan Malloy, ever since he'd been fired at the community center, he'd been itching to get back. The plan was to tape a side door open and stash the tools so that he and Terry King could sneak back in later that afternoon. They smoked a joint in the stairwell, then headed for the safe. John instantly recognized Malloy and knew that he had been fired from the center and why. Wesley told the pair they weren't supposed to be there. According to Malloy, he didn't know about the gun and was scared about what King planned to do. King told him that he was just going to tie them up. Malloy said, let's get out of here. And King said, F off. Then King marched them down to the boiler room. According to Malloy, he never went into the boiler room. to take off, but he didn't. He was scared of King. So we went upstairs and watched King try to break into the safe. According to Terry King, yeah, they'd had robbery on their minds. They'd gone there in the afternoon, 
They'd smoked a joint, but it was Malloy who tried to break into the safe. He'd gotten scared when John recognized Malloy. Then together, they took the two caretakers downstairs. In King's version, Malloy didn't wait outside the boiler room at all. Wesley tried to get the gun away from Malloy. He panicked. Wesley tried to hide behind the boiler. King promised him if he came out, he wouldn't hurt him. According to King, Malloy heard heavy breathing coming from John and started to jump on the victim's head. According to King, Malloy was anxious to go back upstairs. After about 10 minutes, they left and headed to King's girlfriend's place. Two different tales. Meanwhile, Finn Nielsen uses the comparison microscope to match the cartridges from the murder weapon to the rifle recovered from Terry King. Intuition is one thing, proof is another. They match. Sure enough, the Savage 99 is the murder weapon. But whose finger had been on the trigger? With no eyewitness and the court date rapidly approaching, another branch of forensics now comes into play. After police arrested King and Malloy, they also got a search warrant to seize the clothes they had been wearing on the day of the murder. The clothes are sent to the biology lab at the Center of Forensic Science to check for blood from the crime scene. These days, DNA profiling is the criminal investigative technique of the century. But this case predated DNA. At the time of the crime, the blood classification system in use was called ABO. Red blood cells contain antigens, substances responsible for the production of antibodies to combat infection and disease in the body. The presence or absence of two of these antigens, which are called A and B, give us our four distinct human blood groups, A, B, O, and AB. Each human being belongs to one of these groups. In the United States and Canada, for example, the percentages are approximately A, 40%, B, 10%, O, 45%, AB, 5%. So, for instance, if a murder victim has type O blood and a suspect type A, and traces of O are found on the suspect's clothing, it can go a long way to linking the suspect to murder. Everyone is also divided into two groups, RH positive and RH negative. By factoring in these and other blood features, the accuracy of a suspect being guilty are on the order of 3,000 to one, meager compared with DNA profiling, where the figures can be a billion to one, but still enough to convict. And the unknown stains that we, we found on clothing from Mr. Malloy and Mr. King, we subjected those to typing analyses and we established whether there was a connection, if you like, between what was present on their clothing and the reference samples from the, from the victims. At the time of trial, I testified that the blood on Mr. King's shirt was consistent with having originated from the victims, all right, based on the ABO type and the GM types that I obtained. Keith Kelder said tests on Malloy's clothing failed to find any blood that could match that of the two murdered men. But how did King get blood on his clothes?
And the piece of wood was a piece broken off right in here. Because you see the, the, the stock, it's held up on with a, with a bolt that comes up through the middle when there's a hole drilled in it. And that weakens it a little bit. So if you strike this hide against something, it'll break and shatter. But they'd taken the, the pieces with them and left this little piece there. Uh, lucky for us, really. If you know anything about guns, I mean, this 300 Savage would bring down an elephant. And then the trauma to the head. It didn't happen with one blow. It happened with 20 blows, you know, that idea. And you'd, 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 you'd hear the uh, fracturing of the skull, you'd hear it. You'd hear bones breaking. Expertise is not just about the gun or the bullet, but putting the whole picture together. When Finn finally assembles the butt of the rifle, all the pieces finally fall into place. The jury deliberated for an hour and a half. Their verdict? Malloy was found not guilty, but he was charged with break and enter, an accessory after the fact with murder. He was given nine months. My impression of uh, Malloy's involvement in this matter was uh, a follower and a disciple of Terry King. He, he liked uh, King's style, this uh, evil person. Uh, he, he liked that. Uh, I don't think he was necessarily that way, but he liked to follow in the footsteps. King was sentenced with two counts of first-degree murder and therefore was given life imprisonment with no chance of parole for 25 years. Psychopath, devoid of emotion, remorse, nothing. You know, he didn't say these words, but it was, well, they shouldn't have been there. That was the inference. They shouldn't have been there. The object of this botched robbery, the safe, that King and Malloy so desperately wanted to crack and never did, contained only $51. We all lose uh, lovers and friends over the, over the years and family and uh, through routine causes. But when, when you take that loss and that tragedy, it was caused by a Terry King, as you say, an evil person who has taken the life of your son to get $50. Yeah, it hurts to try and discuss that with a family member and make some sense of it. You can't. It's impossible. It gave Bob Strathy a lead. Well, he didn't have one before because you had two strangers who killed two strangers. And where do you start? You know, nobody dropped the wallet at the scene or anything else helpful like that. So uh, it's pretty tough. Finn Nielsen was like Exhibit A, a splinter in the side of King and Malloy. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real. <laughs>